this is. Good afternoon. Y'all have to wake up. <laughs> <laughs> You're that Whitaker guy. <laughs> <laughs> birthday. All right, everybody knows now. <laughs> so, my name is Jim Whitaker. I'm from Southeast Arkansas. I'm going to be talking about sustainable rice farming practices and uh, give you a little background. My brother and I, we've been farming uh, rice, cotton, corn, soybeans uh, since I got out of high school and grew up farming. But for about the last uh, 15 years, I've been farming <coughs> continuous rice, zero grade. So all of our rice, we have gone from contra levees to straight levees and all the way to zero grade on our rice ground. So sustainable rice farming, you know, it, it, it touches three, addresses three concerns, the social, economic, and environmental. So it involves methods that do not completely use up or destroy natural resources. It keeps farms economically viable enhances quality of life for farmers. So it makes life better, makes us money, and it takes care of the environment. So in, and in Southeast Arkansas, you're gonna start right here with dirt pans. We have to get the land leveled, we have to get the uh, potholes, we gotta get the drainage, the irrigation, and this is dirt pans running last summer. Uh, we were putting some more brown grade. So the benefits of zero grade, Water conservation, that's one of the things I'm gonna talk about, the biggest thing, uh, no-till planting. After we harvest this straw, we're gonna usually run a Kelly diamond on it. The next day, we're gonna do another angle. Third day, we're gonna burn it. We're gonna let it flood for the ducts. And that's usually all we're gonna do. All of our equipment's tracked up. Uh, you see some tires on some of that back there, but that's Shane's, uh, this old picture. So we got reduced uh, uh, labor. Maximize equipment efficiency. We're running RTKs on everything, the combines and all. Waterfowl habitat. I'm gonna speak a little bit about waterfowl habitat. Eligibility for conservation programs. <coughs> As you move into sustainable farming, you need to utilize your NRCS office to help you get to where you need to be. Drop pipes, you know, uh, tailwater recoveries, reservoirs, land leveling, uh, nutrient management, waterfowl habitat, all these things are programs that you need to build on and programs that we've used and been very helpful to us to get to where we need to be. <coughs> Picture of our tractors planting no-till. Uh, this is what, what the field looks like. That was probably about April the 10th. On February the 20th, February 25th, it was still flooded for waterfowl. We're gonna allow our fields to stay flooded and we're gonna start a drawdown, a little slow drawdown at the end of February. So we'll still have water into March. She'll pocket some water in fields. And this is a month later, we're on the field planting. Uh, like I said, the only thing I've changed is, is, is everything's tracked now. Picture of a uh, rice almost ready to go flood. You see the stubble and the straw in the middle. Uh, no, no drawback at all that I can think of. So rice water conservation, why is it important? There are about 350 million acres of rice grown globally, and we consume 45% of the global irrigation water. And AWD, alternate wet and drying, could save 30% and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. When alternate wetting is done properly, and you bring water down to the soil surface and allow it to dry just a little bit, your rice field is gonna quit emitting methane gas. You're gonna reduce your methane gas emissions by about 50%. So that also brings us into, into another possible market, which is a carbon market that's developing. Uh, we, have, we have been involved in carbon market in 14, 15, 16, and now 17. Uh, all I can tell you is it's developing. We've yet to see a check, but it is it's coming. They just started a new carbon protocol for corn. Um, it's not going away. So this is water use by practice. Uh, Lee talked about a lot of this, but the red bar right over there, that was where we were in the early 90s. We were contra levee. Uh, so we were using about 45 inches of water. This is 
a study done by, I believe, Joe Massey, a Mississippi State work. Uh, they're very progressive in their water work because they're mandated to, and uh, I, I applaud them for that. So when they go to straight levees, they're going to reduce about five inches of water. Just by going to straight levees, you're just going to knock out five inches of water because you have less levees, you've got less of those loop levees, and you're, you're, you're just losing less water. You've got perimeter road, so you don't have seepage, those type things. So then they go to side inlet, laying a polytubing, and they're going to reduce it another five inches. Intermittent flooding, or AWD, is just above 20 inches of water. The only thing better is zero grade. Zero grade is inherently better because your ground is flat. It doesn't take as much water to cover flat ground. And basically, I'll talk about free board here in a little while, but free board is your friend. So what we've been doing for, we did it, started about four years ago. Merle Landers and uh, Dennis Carman helped me, uh, Rice Tech and RCS, all these guys helped me get there. We started doing work with alternate wet and drying. Last year, we did it on our, our entire farm, which is about 6,300 acres of rice. We saw no yield loss. We had great yields, and we, we averaged about 12 acre inches of irrigation water. So you see where zero grades at 20, we're down here at 12. These guys are over here at 45. For every acre of irrigation water, Jason, what they roughly think? A couple two to three dollars per acre inch? Yeah, usually you say three acre inches on diesel be nine For free? So a reduction of, let me go back, good night. Reduction of uh, 30 inches of water, that's $90 an acre savings. So if you want to figure out how to convert your farm from contour levy to straight levies to zero grade, whatever, you're going to almost pay the return on investment just in water savings alone. So uh, to get more into that, I'm not going to. All right, so reducing our global footprint, work done in Erie, uh, in the Philippines shows that uh, AWD can reduce the uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 48%. AWD also reduces uh, global warming by 43%. This is research that they've been doing. These irrigation methods that not only save water, save your aquifer, are now affecting climate change. So alternate wet and drying. I grow a lot of hybrids. Uh, hybrids have been good to me. Hybrids are also very um, hardy. They're, they have a lot of uh, risk tolerance, so they work well into this type of environment. I do grow some conventionals. But this is what a typical field setup would look like. I flag all of my pipes with a piece of PVC, put a reflector around it. Everything lights up at night so you can see where everything's at. This is a flash bulb riser. I found that that is the best uh, flood control box. The plastic is easy to install and right there you see I've got extra boards that's called free board once I establish my flood every field is going to have at least four inches of free board added to the pipe and there may be another board laying on top so when my rice is little no free board when it gets a little bigger I'm going to add free board and why because we get three to five inches of rain all the time in the mid-south so if I get a couple inches of rain, I capture all, every inch I get, it captures on that zero grade field. This right here is a Mississippi State float, got a little cork on it, got some um, color indicators. Uh, we built them in our shop. This is an Isbel float, a lot nicer, a lot more visible. Um, we have installed these in every field. So my guys can drive by, not get out of the truck, they can see what we're doing, and why this is important, I'm going for zero. I want zero standing water. He said we got a yield bump, I'm gonna take him for his word. What I have seen is it just works. I'm telling you, zero water or something about, you remember how granddaddy used to drain for straight head? And, and, you, and then, then the old timer said, I just like to drain, like to dry that soil for water weevils. I don't know what I was going on, but I'm just telling you something's going on in your rice field, it's good. 
This is ET gauge. It's measuring evaporation. You do not need that. I'm about to tell you what in, in a, Southeast Arkansas, you're losing about a quarter to a third of evaporation a day. Quarter, quarter of an inch of water a day. So, I'm going to stretch your mind just a little bit. If we have four inches of flood on a buckshot zero grade field, I'm losing a quarter of an inch a day. How many days of available water is on that field? 16. My buddy's got a sharp mind. 16 days. So if I drive by here and my guy would take notes and he says, whatever you call your field, four inches, and I looked at his notebook, I could almost say, hey, there's no need to go back to that farm for a week. I need you to mow term rows. I need you to help lay poly pipe on the corn, the cotton, other things. Get grain bins ready. It is a tool to help you ir uh, schedule irrigation. Once I see that I have 15 days, 16 days of available water, I can figure out where I want to put my water. I want to put it on soybeans, I want to put it on corn, I want to put it on cotton. You schedule your irrigation, family vacation, whatever. But Jason and Lee's study show that we can go to a negative four. So now what have I got on that field? I got a lot, of, I got a, a whole stinking month. Flood my field up. And it's almost a whole stinking month before we have to activate irrigation again. You see how this is just, now you see how we're only using 12 inches of water because in South Arkansas, you're going to, we caught 22 acre inches of rainfall in the growing season. So I probably needed 30 inches of water to grow my crop, but the good Lord gave me 20 of them. And we captured it with that box. Uh, more with less. This is a concept of sustainability, doing more with less. Hybrids are 35.9% more efficient users of water. So we don't have any uh, guys in here that don't roll their eyes at that so I can move on. Uh, the way they come up with the number is shorter growing season, uses just a little bit less water, higher yield, Divided by your acre inches, that's where they get that. Okay, that right there has got to stop. That is a, a, a ditch running through my farm. It's called boggy bile. That is after a rain event, that is muddy water. That's all of our topsoil leaving, all of my neighbors and all of my farms. And topsoil is leaving because we're doing too much tillage. We're keeping everything sprayed absolutely clean. Our turn rows are sprayed. Everything's sprayed. And all of it's running off in that ditch. We are about 60% tailwater or surface water. So this is a tailwater pump. It's outfitted with a water meter. We're metering a little bit over 2,000 acres on a yearly study. So when I talk about my numbers, they're not on just some small plot. They're on big acres. Give it more... Uh, size and scope to it, but that muddy water, we're, we're, we're losing our topsoil every time it rains. That is the same time frame, that's water leaving one of our rice fields. The reason that water is clear is because we slowed it down, we slowed the discharge down. It's on a zero grade field, it's having the time to settle, sediment, settling out, and it's leaving. Rice is a good uh, crop that does a very good job of cleaning up water. And we've got to tell our story, and we've got to, uh, you know, one thing farmers are not very good at is telling our story. We have to let everyone know that we're good conservationists, rice farmers are good, and rice is a healthy choice, and we're good for our environment. So I want to prove that. I want to prove that water was better when it left our farm than when it came on. So I participated with ARS, in Jonesboro this year with a 14-week study. This is my son, Scott David. We measured water entering the farm, going into the reservoir, into the tailwater recovery, um, and in like six or eight fields, and then as it left the farm. This is side by side, just a visual. This is water getting pumped out of that ditch. This is water 100 feet away inside the rice field.
This is cotton, corn, soybean water. It just is. I'm just telling you. They plow, they plow every acre where I'm at. They work every acre. They plow every acre. And that's their, that's their topsoil. Topsoil is found in the top just a little bit of our soil, and we're losing it every day going to the Gulf of Mexico. More or less. I'm going to keep going on that. We need to figure out how to be more efficient with our nitrogen. One of the things that I've seen is, um, Lee, I've I never seen that slide where he said that AWD makes you more efficient with nitrogen. Uh, Merle has been telling me for for uh, years that, that there's some unexplained when you kind of dry down that soil, you get this kind of bump in nitrogen, na native nitrogen. So what I can tell you is Six years ago, we were using about 190 units of nitrogen on our hybrids. Why? Because all your neighbors were, and you want to make, <coughs> you got to get every bushel, right? <coughs> we're going to start off harvesting, and we're making, you know, 200 bushel rice. I mean, maybe better. Man, it looked good. It was this tall. I mean, the heads were touching right up on the chin. And then one rain event comes through, thousands of acres on the ground. And it would pick up the rest of the crop at 0.8 to 1.2 miles per hour. Yield crashes. So we started thinking we're going to reduce our nitrogen. So in um, nutrient management, we, we grid sample all of our acres. Rob does. He, he does our uh, uh, soil and nutrient management. We do variable rate. Whether it comes out of a truck, an airplane, whatever, we're trying to write a variable rate, trying to write a variable rate script for our, our soil. Cotton, corn, beans, rice. We've uh, done a little bit of variable nitrogen work on rice. Uh, Don has helped us with that through some aerial imagery. We're working on fine tuning that. We do not know where that's going to lead. Maybe it has some merit, maybe it doesn't. Okay, NSTAR. Four or five years ago, I did instar plots on my farm. I'm not saying instar works, but I am telling you that when I got the recommendation, it was calling for around 100 units of nitrogen. I'm putting out 180. We backed down, and we did not see any yield drops. So that really got me thinking. How much nitrogen are we using? How much are we being efficient with? What I can tell you is, this is a, a, my dumbed down version. If your rice is too tall, if it's lodging, if it has disease, if it has smut or kernel smut, especially if it's laying down, you are without a doubt putting too much nitrogen. If you're cutting your crop on the ground and you're putting out a fungicide on hybrids, you're, there's not a question of if you put out too much, you did. Hybrids should be about this tall they should be a little thin. When, they, when you starve them for nitrogen a little bit, they're not going to be as lush. They're going to be a little yellow. But you, what, what I've seen is my yields are steady climbing because I'm harvesting it standing instead of laying down. No fungicides. It's just nitrogen um, is a big deal. We've got to get a handle on nitrogen. Water and nitrogen, we've got to get a handle on Hey, Jim? Yes. Have y'all started looking at the Green Seeker technology? You used any of that last year? We used some Green Seeker three years ago, Rob. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're trying to get a grant to study all of it, but we're just not there yet. So, I talked about water. Now I'm going to talk about my other favorite one, waterfowl. Rice supports 45% of North American waterfowl. Waterfowl depends on our crops to be there for their habitat. They start off in Canada, they, they come down every winter. If we bare soil, till every acre of rice, every acre of beans, every acre of corn, where are they going to, what are they going to use for a habitat? They don't have any habitat. So if we want to tell our story, we're going to have to be good stewards of water, we're going to have to be good stewards of our habitat, and we're going to have to be good stewards of nitrogen. That is a story that will sell to any consumer. 
waterfowl is just a big part of what we do. Every acre of ours is, is, is flooded for waterfowl. Um, I can't say enough about it. No, no downside whatsoever. This is my consultant. Rob, raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> you needed a bigger picture. <laughs> <laughs> got lost some of his head. Look at all that rice. Look at that rice. <laughs> look at that rice. Is that gorgeous? All right, here's what I'm going to say. I, I don't see very many. Some, I know some, there's some farmers in here, but here's what I'm going to say. If you're farming without a consultant, stop. I've got a good farmer friend. He says, I don't need a consultant. I, he's South, South Louisiana. I, I need to say it like he said. He, he said, you boys, y'all need that consultant. We don't need a consultant. <laughs> he said, our chemical company take care of us. I said, yeah, they take care of you, all right. <laughs> consultant will save you more money, make you more money than anything you can do. That is my family. Uh, we're very proud of what we do. Any questions? <clears throat> Comments? Me, Lee, either one. So I, I got one, I guess, and I, I didn't really explain this really well. You know, go ahead and butt in, but for alternate wetting and drying and what your recommendation is and also what we've seen is, you know, as far as nitrogen management and, and uh, the efficiency of what we apply pre-flood uh, is really key to keep that flood established for 21 days after we apply our pre-flood nitrogen. Let that plant take up everything it's going to take up before we start the alternate wetting and drying. If not, we're losing it to denitrification, money volatilization, and then you know mid-season if we're putting on a mid-season shot, make sure that water you know is 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 established on the field two to four inches. Apply it into the flood water, not on a bare soil surface. Um, you know, we we can lose anywhere from 30 to 40 percent within two days if we're applying it to a moist soil surface and not into the water. So, nitrogen efficiency is huge with that. And then also another, I guess, safeguard precaution. Uh, and this is this is really worldwide, and we we've, we've found it to be true. Um, especially in dry years, once we start heading and we start getting, um, you know, we're flowering and we're going through that progression anywhere from you know, hybrid maybe 14 days uh, for our varieties maybe around 10. But once we start that progression of flowering down that panicle and through the, the top of the canopy, we have to keep a, ma a flood maintained. We would like to keep the flood maintained during that time, especially if we got high nighttime temperatures, because we don't want that plant to suffer. Uh, through the nights cause heat and sterility. So we want to keep that safe, keep the water uh, up on those rice plants during that time. Uh, it's just another, I guess, cheap insurance on the front end. And like you say, and what, what we do is a little different because he's dealing with side inlet, straight levees. With zero grade, once we establish the flood, we'll try to keep the flood maintained for 10 days. But really, once I establish it, I have enough available water in the field to take me out to that 21 days. Yeah, so you're still not going below, like That's you're right. not drying out within that no. 21 days. I mean, and it, it, it really, it's not a function of how deep the water is, it's a function of if we've got water on the field, we drive that soil from an aerobic state to an anaerobic state, and so that, you know, our nit nitrogen dynamics within that soil profile and the zone right around the roots um, is, is really critical during that time period so Doc, you may you probably have the most sophisticated data in the world on the uh, improved nitrogen uptake and this low water use of virus every time we show we, everybody says it's a fluke and I know the technical answer but you, you tell me you saw the same thing in a very sophisticated manner but just give it to some common sense like, well, what does well, it mean it's not magic yeah, right? no, it wasn't, I don't know how sophisticated it was but we, we had five years of that 15 data and what we found basically, you reached a point as the field dried down where the plants actually, uh, the, the microbial population shifted and you went from your or, or, inorganic or your nitrogen fertilizer source to the organic source. So that you, the total end uptake, if you were looking only at total end in, in uptake, it would be pretty much the same. But the real question under that was where was that plant getting that nitrogen? Was it getting it from the fertilizer or from the organic matter or the organic compounds in the soil. 
And we're thinking that basically you're shifting it more towards the organic matter side by the dry down. And, and that also opens up the, the sort of <laughs> the ideas of, uh, and they're using this now in California, on that first dry down when you're, it's a pretty safe time. You're not really into green ring or panicle development. If you do let it dry, so it's dry, and then if you want to put it on the mid-season or a second shot, do it then because it would be just the same. It would be dry, flood it back up again, and go back into your normal cycle because then you're taking away that 25, 35% you're gonna lose in volatilization. So basically, you know, my, my idea is if, if you wanna give me the money for that percentage of your fertilizer, I'll be glad to take it. Uh, but you're, you, you, you could look at a little lower amount, but a lot of that depends on being able to deliver the water to the field in time. You don't want to have it, uh, you know, going on slow. You want to be able to uh, fill that. But what we see is exactly what you saw, and, and we're thinking it's more um, an issue of whether it's organic versus inorganic nitrogen supply. Right. Yeah, so in that first drawdown, tap into that, that, you know, inorganic, and adding on to what we've already got in there. So, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a real phenomenon. We've seen it. I know this doesn't really apply to zero grade. I guess it could, but where would maybe your cover crops play into some of this moisture thing and nitrogen pieces of it as well? From the standpoint of moisture retention, weed control, carbon. We control. tried. We tried cover crop this year. We knocked it. We before we harvested, we flew in a seven blend cover crop. Uh, three of the blends were for wildlife. Uh, millet and uh, some other things. So we hit it twice with the Kelly Diamond and it rained for two straight weeks. Nothing nothing emerged, everything rotted. We were going to use the cover crop for straw decomposition because uh, straw is another thing that we're going to have to figure out sometime. I don't know how to figure out a cover crop in the, in the rice. We use the waterfowl as our cover, but they are doing some in Arkansas cover crops, but they're, yeah, so they're rotating not, into beans. Yeah, we're not doing any cover crop and rice right now, but I think it does, you know, in this whole system that we're talking about, especially on soybean rotation, um, you know, having that, uh, these different irrigation systems, we go from something like soybeans to say we do a, a roll or rice, and then that, you know, especially on our, if we're doing a rice tool, um, you know, I think it really would play in just like it does with our corn and soybeans on, you know, Slowing down water, um, you know, establishing a good heavy cover crop and, and retaining some of that moisture, especially early on. All right. So, um, Lee, Dr. Jason, Michelle, way back in the back, Merle Landers, these are y'all's experts in the field. Uh, you got any water questions, ask them. I'm just implementing. Thank <laughs> you.